Alrighty, this is a motherboard that I just received from eBay. Uh, paid the hefty sum of $15 for this board. So, needless to say, I wasn't expecting too much. But, uh, with a cursory glance of the board here, you can see that we're missing CIAU2, missing the SID chip, PLA chip, and the VIC chip. So, uh, Obviously, those will have to be replaced before we can go much farther. And another thing, uh, you can see these two little diodes here. Uh, that's part of a factory fix, so that's to be expected. We have some Fairchild memory chips. Or Fujitsu, I can't remember. I think it might be Fujitsu anyways. These chips right here throw up an immediate red flag. Uh, these are small MOS logic chips. Now, uh... Anybody who's done any work in Commodore motherboards before knows that these MOS logic chips have terrible track records. Uh, very, very often you'll find that the memory multiplexers right here, which is a uh, U25 and U13, have been, have failed. Um, and quite often you'll find one of these two or more failed as well. Uh, it's so bad that whenever I find these small MOS logic chips in a Commodore 64 board, I pretty much universally replace them whether they're still working or not. Uh, it's just not worth leaving them in a board because their track record is so bad. Um, the other thing about those chips too is they seem to consume a lot more current than a standard LS part from another manufacturer. You can put your finger on them and actually feel the heat being generated by the chip. Uh, so that tells me, you know, even if the chip still works, it's just sitting there burning power for no real apparent reason. And uh, you don't want to waste power on a motherboard like this because you've only got one and a half amps available from the power supply. So if you wanted to use some more high-powered Commodore goodies, it would be a good idea to replace them. The other thing about this board, too, is it doesn't smell very good. It smells really mildewy, so we're going to have to do something about that, too. So uh, anyways, um, I haven't plugged this board in or tried putting chips in it and firing it up or anything, so we're going to go through this thing together. Um, it'll figure things out right along with me. And I've been trying to make more videos of repairing Commodore 64s, but it's been so incredibly difficult getting a hold of broken Commodore 64s to repair. Uh, all the machines in my personal collection have already been repaired uh, and the prices on them online have just gotten to the point where the amount of difference between the price of a fully working tested machine versus a broken untested one is so small that it's, it just doesn't make economic sense but I happen to get this board for cheap so let's try to bring this one back to life and there's no reason it can't so uh, anyways, uh, let's start in on it. I think the first thing I'm going to do is clean the board, probably remove the back shield, and see if I can't get this thing to stop smelling so bad. Uh, I suspect the main culprit is the paper backing shield, because uh, in between the shield and the rear of it, this thing here is actually a paper separator. You can actually see part of it poking out right there. So. Uh, We'll get that off. I have a couple different shields I can put back on this thing, so hose the board down with some sort of chemical or solvent, and that should probably take care of the smell quite a bit. Alrighty then. Well, let's continue on and see what we find. I have the board clean now. I just uh, hosed it down with some isopropyl alcohol. Uh, you want the strongest percentage you can find. I think I was using 91%. It evaporates pretty quickly. And uh, remove the back shield, as you can tell. And from uh, examining the back of the board, it doesn't look like this has had any work performed on it. Which is a good thing, because that means uh, you don't have to go back and repair someone else's botched previous repair attempt. So, anyways, let's uh, get into this thing and stick some chi chips into it and uh, see what we get. Alright, I have the board populated with some chips. Got a CIA, PLA, and a VIC chip put into it. Um, right now, I... I usually don't populate the SID chip on boards that uh, I have no idea about. Uh, those usually get put in at the last moment because, uh, as you well know, SID chips are valuable and precious. 
but uh, right now I only have the video connector and power hooked up. So let's go ahead and flip the power switch for the very first time and see what happens. All right. Ooh, we're actually getting something. So as you can see, we had an NTSC signal, which that tells me the 8701 clock chip is good, which that's, uh, that's definitely a bonus. Oh, this is interesting. You can actually see the uh, characters coming in. <laughs> this is definitely neat. This is not a failure I've ever exactly seen before. Especially with the 0000, zero, 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 zero bytes free. That is even more interesting. This leads me to believe it might be the character ROM chip that's causing this issue. The other thing is too, as you can see as it's warming up, uh, it's actually getting better. This is pretty interesting. I was really hoping this board had uh, an interesting fault because uh, it's it's no fun when you just pop out a PLA and put another one in and magically the board works again. So uh, now that it's been on for a minute, that is something else. Well, it's cleared up now, so uh, let's do the, the easy things first and test these ROM chips, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, right now, I'm not going to play with any logic probes or oscilloscopes or anything, because to be honest with you, the vast majority of Commodore 64 repairs, when you know what to look for, don't require any of those tools. And that's a bonus for people that are getting into this, uh, that don't happen to have you know, a whole bunch of extra tools on hand, you know, with a decent soldering iron, a desoldering pump, you can get a, a long ways on repairing Commodore 64s. So, uh, anyways, let's try out a couple of these chips and uh, start working our way through the board. All right, I have my chip testing board. It's uh, hooked up and everything. I have the character ROM from this board extracted, placed in my chip testing board. So we're going to go through these ROMs one by one and uh, see what we get. Well, uh, that looks pretty good to me. I'd say that ROM's okay. Alrighty, seems like I may have been led down the wrong path. Let me show you what I've just discovered playing with the board. I went ahead and pulled all of the ROM chips, tested them in the chip testing board. They were fine. The reason why I suspected this character ROM is I have seen a couple fail and give you a similar pattern exactly like was shown when I first started the board up. So anyways, I was going around and pressing on the board and things to see if there was some sort of a short or something because that's always a good thing to do. And uh, this is what I discovered. Now I'm twisting this socket pretty forcefully with my fingers. When I let go of it, look what happens. And it crashes. So there's a pretty good chance. The only problem with this board is this PLA socket. So I'm going to go ahead and whip that out of there and uh, try a brand new socket. So we got the board back on the bench. I went ahead and removed the offending socket. And uh, I have the socket right here. Now if you can look down in there, you see how those pins are smashed down? There's one there and there's a couple on the other side. That was the issue. Uh, these these types of sockets are known as single wipe sockets because you see they've only got one pin in them. Uh, most of the sockets they use nowadays are what they call dual wipe. They have pins on both sides. And that's what I've installed there. So. Uh, Anyways, let's go ahead and fire this up and I'll show you that it's working now. And there's Easy Flash 3. Uh, so far, the board looks like it's uh, working okay. There's the uh, good old Ghost and Goblins. And I think we might have a winner here. Now the thing about this board that I find interesting is uh, these MOS7708 chips, the memory multiplexers, they're actually copies of 74LS257 chips. 
uh, those are actually in working condition, which is kind of amazing because I see a failure rate of at least 50% or higher on these chips. So uh, before I call this one done, I might actually remove those install sockets and uh, put a set of 257 chips like this in their place. Since I have quite a lot of 257 memory multiplexers laying around. I clean up the board a little more, so. Anyways, uh, I'm going to throw the diagnostic test harness on this thing and make sure everything is working as it should, and uh, I'll probably call this one good. So just a second, then I'll get the harness on. All right. As you can see, I have the diagnostic test harness installed. So let's go ahead and turn on the board and see what we get. Now earlier in the video, um, I was kind of excited to see the fault that this board was presenting because I thought maybe it would be something interesting to repair because <laughs> I do remember saying, oh, it's kind of boring when all you have to do is replace a PLA and the board magically starts working again. Uh, in this case, it doesn't seem to have been a PLA, but uh, it actually was the socket. But that's just one of those things you really got to, you know, use your eyes and use your brain and see what's going on. Because one thing I always tell myself, oh, control port bad. Well, there's a good reason why, missing a SID chip. So I think what I'm going to do now is uh, stick a SID chip in this thing. A, uh, I have a test SID chip that I use that doesn't sound the greatest, but it still works fine. And I'll put that in there. Uh, like I said, I don't stick good SID chips in boards like this until I know they're 100% okay. Uh, it's just one of those paranoia things you know said chips being worth as much money as they are now uh, I'd like to keep all the working ones I have in working condition so let me put a SID chip in this board and uh, we'll see how it works. We have a SID chip installed let's go ahead and turn it on as I was saying earlier a uh, sort of a motto I have when I'm repairing Commodore 64's is that if you have all of your voltages present you know you have a, a known good working set of chips in the board and all of the connections are being properly made you know there's no bad traces or anything like that uh, the board pretty much has to work you know it's, it's simple physics um, I've come across some really difficult to track down faults before and you know a lot of times I'll get kinda sent down the wrong paths kinda similar to how this board was initially uh, but every once in a while you kind of have to stop and take a breather and you know see what you've done and what you've checked so far and you know see the things that you can roll out so anyways with a minimal amount of work we got this $15 eBay board running again so anyways that was my video <clears throat> and uh, thank you for watching and I'll try to come back with some more interesting videos as, as time goes on uh, but like I said it's getting really difficult finding broken machines that actually repair to show on the channel so uh, hopefully we can do something about that in the future but I'm planning on some more content and uh, I'll be back with a new video soon I hope anyways thanks for watching